Elizabeth Eckford and Hazel Bryan. The story behind the photograph that shamed America. One was trying to go to school. The other didn't want her there. Together, Elizabeth Eckford and Hazel Bryan starred in one of the most memorable photographs of the civil rights era. But their story had only just begun. On her first morning of school, September 4th, 1957, Elizabeth Eckford's primary concern was looking nice. Her mother had done her hair the night before, an elaborate two-hour ritual, with a hot iron and a hotter stove of straightening and curling. Then there were her clothes. People in Black Little Rock knew that Eckford girls were expert seamstresses. Practically everything they wore, they made themselves, and not from the basic patterns of McCall's, but from more complicated ones in vogue. It was a practice born of tradition, pride, and necessity. Homemade was cheaper, and it spared Black children the humiliation of having to ask to try things on in the segregated department of stores downtown. In the fall of 1957, Elizabeth was among nine Black students who had enlisted, then been selected, to enter Little Rock Central High School. Central was the first high school in a major southern city set to be desegregated since the United States Supreme Court had ruled three years earlier in Brown versus Board of Education that separate and equal education was unconstitutional. On the television as Elizabeth ate her breakfast, a newsman described large crowds gathering around Central. It was all her mother Bertie needed to hear. Turn that thing off, she shouted. Should anyone say something nasty at her, she counseled Elizabeth, pretend not to hear them. Or better yet, be nice and put them to shame. Lots of white people lined Park Street as Elizabeth headed towards the school. As she passed the mobile station and came near, she could see the white students filtering unimpeded past the soldiers. To her, it was a sign that everything was all right. But as she herself approached, three guardsmen, two with rifles, held out their arms, directing her to left, to the far side of Park. A crowd had started to form behind Elizabeth and her knees began to shake. She continued down park. For an instant, she faced the school. It just looked so big. She steadied herself, then walked up to another soldier. He didn't move. When she tried to squeeze past him, he raised his carbine. Other soldiers moved over to assist him. When she tried to get in around them, they moved to block her way. They glared at her. Now, as Elizabeth continued walking south down park, more and more of the people lining the street fell in behind her. Some were central students, others adults. They started shouting at her. The reporters on the scene scribbled down what they heard. Lynch her, lynch her, go home. And word, looking for a friendly face, Elizabeth turned to an old white woman. The woman spat on her. Three young girls, barely into their teens, fell directly behind Elizabeth. They were clearly together and clearly students. Two of them, like Elizabeth, carried books. They wanted to be at the very center of things, and they wanted to get really close to Elizabeth, close enough to let her know that they didn't want her in their school. Two, four, six, eight, we don't want to integrate, they chanted. One girl, Hazel Bryan, looked livid, her face poisoned with hate. Her eyes narrowed, her brow furrowed, her teeth clenched. Hazel shouted, go home, N-word, go back to a click fricka. Will counts a photographer for the Arkansas Democrat in his picture. When it comes down to it, Counts' famous photograph of Elizabeth Eckford is really more of Hazel Bryan. It is on Hazel that the eyes land and linger. Despite the tricky lighting, her face is perfectly exposed. The early morning September sun shines on her like a spotlight. It hits her from the side, making it look more demonic still. She's caught mid-vowel with her mouth gapingly, ferociously open. Others played their own small parts in the picture, but the mouth, she later said, was mine. And dressing that morning as she had, trying to look all grown up, she had masked how young she really was. She was only 15, but she would always be seen and judged as an adult. The next morning, Elizabeth and Hazel landed on millions of doorsteps. The initial reports from inside were encouraging. The teachers are very nice. Nothing went wrong. There were no catcalls. I especially enjoyed my history and English classes, Elizabeth reported that after that first day. Everything will be all right, for the majority of the white students themselves are all right. Soon, though... There were disquieting signs. On October 1st, while walking down the hall, Elizabeth was struck from behind with a pencil. In gym class the next day, someone threw a rock at her. When a soldier asked who, the white students just laughed. Elizabeth suffered disproportionately. Apart from being the most vulnerable, she was also the most symbolically potent. If only they could drive out the girl who had come to epitomize the nine, the segregationists may have hoped. The others would quickly follow, and the whole integrationist idea would crumble. 
Elizabeth had to be coaxed into participating in the 40th anniversary celebrations in 1997. Elizabeth gradually became involved, meeting planners of the Visitor Center and National Park Center, the National Park Service planned to open in the old mobile station near the school. After the ceremony, both women were connected through the original photographer. For a moment, the two women faced one another. Still imagining Hazel as blonde, Elizabeth was taken a bit aback to behold a brunette. Hi, I've always wanted to meet you, Elizabeth told her. You're mighty brave to face the cameras again, she told Hazel as the three visitors entered the house. Hazel found the remark puzzling. Elizabeth seemed to be warning her of she couldn't foresee. When the anniversary commemorations ended in late September of 1997, Elizabeth and Hazel prepared to go their very separate ways. But as time passed, Hazel realized that she wasn't ready to let go. In mid-November, Hazel invited Elizabeth and two of her sister Anna's grandchildren to her house. Then later that month came the poster signing. A large crowd shut up. As for the poster itself, Hazel thought the original picture was too small. As much as she hated it, she believed it couldn't and shouldn't be hidden. Elizabeth had a different problem with it. She thought the title, Reconciliation, overstated. There was a big difference between that and forgiveness. Their encounters gradually became more frequent, almost routine. Over the next several months, they went to a home and garden show and bought daylilies and irises together. They shopped for fabrics together. They heard Maya Angelou read poetry together. But strain soon surfaced. The source was Elizabeth, and it was predictable, for she had always been the harder sell. Her usual wariness, vigilance, and perfectionism could be kept at bay only so long. As the two shared more time and platforms, Elizabeth spotted what she perceived to be discrepancies, inconsistencies, and evasions in Hazel's story. The fissure was painfully apparently in March, 18 months into their relationship, when they met Linda Monk, a lawyer-turned-writer who hoped to write a book about the women. She recorded some of their sessions, and those taped conversations captured how Elizabeth's mood had changed. After you saw Count's picture in the paper, you don't remember how you felt or what people close to you talked about? She asked Hazel incredul incredulously at one point. There wasn't much conversation about it, really, replied Hazel. What she'd done in that morning had been so banal, just hamming up and being recognized, getting attention, that it hadn't been worth remembering, she insisted. Maybe she had a block, but Elizabeth wasn't buying it. Elizabeth had forgiven Hazel, but that forgiveness, she concluded, had been obtained under false pretenses. Hazel hadn't fully owned up to her past. Early in 2000s, Kathy Collins, the, sociolo the sociologist who had conducted the racial healing seminar Elizabeth and Hazel had attended, invited them for catfish at a local restaurant. Collins planned to write her dissertation on the two of them and wanted to discuss the project. She had picked up no bad vibes that evening, but Elizabeth had. Hazel seemed very much on edge. Her instincts were sound. Hazel had had enough. They would no longer see each other. Quietly, unceremoniously, unceremoniously, their great experiment in racial reproachment was over. The reconciliation poster was popular enough to warrant another printing. Elizabeth let them go ahead. It was her way of supporting the place. Now, though, she insisted that it carry a caveat. One she devised herself. Soon, a small sticker resembling the Surgeon General's warning on cigarette packs appeared in the upper right-hand corner. It was gold and relatively inconspicuous, particularly against Central's ochre bricks. True reconciliation can occur only when we honestly acknowledge our painful but shared past. Elizabeth Eckford. The message puzzled Hazel, who had not been consulted about either the reprinting or the disclaimer. As far as she was concerned, acknowledge the painful but shared past was just what she had been trying to do. She'd have liked to have had her own sticker, one that said, true reconciliation can only occur, can occur only when we honestly let go of resentment and hatred and move forward. The poster continued to hang in the office of Central, Central's principal, Nancy Rousseau, though more as an ideal than a reflection of reality. I just had hoped that I could show this picture and say, this happened, and that happened, and now, and there is no now, she said. And that makes me sad. It makes me sad for them. It makes me sad for the future students at our school and for the history books, because I'd like a happy ending, and we don't have that.